And while everyone is getting settled, um, I want to thank you again for joining us at the second uh, and last <laughs> uh, small grantee symposium of the Black Studies Collaboratory. And um, I wanna, I'm going to hand it over to our new colleague in the Department of Art History, Dr. Zama Nseli Nseli. Good afternoon to you all. My name is Zaman Zele Nzele. Um, I'm a professor at uh, the History of Art Department in African and African Diasporic Visual Arts. I'm originally from South Africa, and it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, it's really just so delightful. And um, yeah, and I'm just really excited to make my small contribution to this really amazing program. Uh, through moderating this panel, uh, aptly titled Black Gathering. And so I just prepared like a small note um, that should uh, preface or just lead us into the presentations on Black Gathering. So gathering can be a noun or a verb that connotes subversive or restorative associations. We gather what is separated, apart, shattered, broken up or displaced. Gathering when paired with black suggests a togetherness away from interruption or disruption. Ultimately, black gathering co-creates spaces for coming together, a togetherness that has been so important to our survival and our renewal. The spirit of gathering is layered and rich, and I'm keen to see how it emerges from the research work and the activities of the grantees. With that said, I welcome our first speaker, Valencia, um, so you can take us away. You want to welcome to sit here? Oh, I can. Yeah. Oh. Um, you can just begin by briefly describing your project, what it was, and what you accomplished. Okay. Um, so, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Valencia. Um, I'm actually a second, okay. I'm a second year MFA student in the art practice department. And uh, the name of my project is uh, Landship Valiant Star. Um, I had some slides, but I don't know if it's, um, okay. Uh, let's see if it will come up. Um, so uh, my project is like multimodal research and is also an art installation. Um, I started the research last year and um, started to explore the history of the Barbados landship. Uh, this is a sociocultural movement that um, was started by black working class in Barbados to, as a way of collective survival in the harsh economic and uh, racial uh, environment um, uh, after the abolition of slavery up until like the independence in 1966. So um, there are different forms it took. Uh, so one was collective saving, known as susu, um, really coming from like that word, that Ghanaian word, like how um, there's weekly contributions and that, you know, na like neighbors could save together in case of, you know, any um, emergencies or even having like a bonus at the end of the year. Um, it was also a masquerade, so they appropriated the, um, the structure um, and the uniforms of the British Navy uh, as a way of uh, just organizing themselves, you know, having like this, like creating their own dignity and humanity in, a, in a situations where they were told they were less than so, and they're also able to take up space publicly, have processions and parades. And so um, in this uh, installation that I did um, at the beginning of the year uh, in the Worth Rider Art Gallery, I, um, drew, I was drawing on this um, bibliographic research and also like kind of um, like it's very obscured in Barbados. So it's like on this, there's a movement on the brink of extinction, like for decades, um, they're having trouble to get new members. And I feel like the reason for that is because it's become like just known for the, the parades and the spectacle of the performance. And so there's a disconnect. And, and I feel the disconnect with the history is a big part of that and understanding that, well, this is actually rooted in 
um, Black peoples um, gathering and forming like creative ways to survive. Um, it is actually misunderstood as like um, imitating the the colonizer. So, um, so I, I create this installation as a way to kind of reclaim that, and I'm um, gonna also. So that was the first part, and then I through this grant um, by the Black Studies uh, Collaboratory as well as the Berkeley Center for New Media, I was able to travel to Barbados because I also felt the tension of creating a work that is very much about a specific geography it was created there. And then I'm here <laughs> trying to like, um, ask these tough questions on how it, how it can have a future. So I was able to um, go to Barbados, visit the dock, which is the gathering, the official gathering space of the Barbados landship and speak with lifelong uh, senior members. Um, there's Admiral, Elton Graves on the far right, um, Inspector Edith Baker, and Commander um, uh, Roland Jokes, and they, they, you know, they gave me insight into like their stories um, around joining the land ship. And then I was also able to connect with um, someone who's been very instrumental in my formative years as a young um, dance artist, uh, Dr. John Hunt, who is actually at the helm of this new revival that's happening in Barbados with the land shift. So, um, and this was kind of all in development while I was working on the project, but they're in the schools now, teaching children the dances. And so it's a huge um, push in, in really um, uh, cultivating a pride in, in this and getting a, a deeper understanding out to the public. Um, and so I, I asked them to teach me land shift dances and I, with the interviews and, and the footage of, of the class, then I created a, a video work. Um, and it's actually now on, on view in um, a Soma Arts Gallery in San Francisco. So I have a new iteration of the installation that includes the video. Um, and so it's actually gonna be um, on show until October 6th, it's um, open now, so. Uh, I, I don't know how much time I have, but I, I had a small clip of the video. Um, you can show it. It's okay. okay. There's audio. So interestingly enough, you can go down. And some people will say, use the naval terminology, port and aft, or left and right. So if I went port, you will go to left. Let me say aft, you go to the right. Right? So to me, landship is pretty much what I would call the masquerade of Barbados. It is one that represents the particular history and circumstances around Barbados um, from its development as a colony through the enslaved period into the emancipation period up until now, and what has happened to the experiences and information of African heritage people who would have come through that, to those times. Um, it's particular because of the particular ways in which Barbados was colonized by Britain and how the people who found themselves in this space were able to persist in um, privileging their identity in these hostile environments. So to me, to me, if you talk about re Jamaica, you talk about reggae, if you talk about carnival, you talk about Trinidad, Right? So when you talk about Barbados, in certain regards, you talk about landship. Because as I hear that landship, you know, was enjoyment time for the average, average class people, you know, especially in the things, was the only, in them days, was the only, you know, activities to be had back in the 60s and the 70s, even inside the 90s, so it's concerned. You understand? Landship was always there with the, in gym, they call the killing jump. They jump, killing jump through the districts and the villages and, and so on. And that caused me, that, that, that music, that music caused me to be a member to, to join there. <laughs> I, 
I hope that you can make it to uh, Soma Arts Gallery and uh, to see uh, more of the, of, of the video and about this tradition. So thank you very much. Thank you, Valencia. And we will have Delphine next. All right, hi everyone. Um, thank you all so much for being here. I'm really grateful to be on a panel um, called Black Gathering because um, it is kind of the ethos of the day and it's really uh, beautiful and nourishing to be here with you all. Um, I guess my a disclosure is that I'm a cancer, so I also find this hyper emotional. So I'll probably cry, but it's who I am. We just roll with it. Um, I'm really grateful for this project. Uh, I've been working uh, with a group of curators um, in a loose kind of collective on a project dedicated to uh, Kathleen Neal Cleaver, um, who you all likely are familiar with, uh, the Black Panther. Um, and we've been working on a exhibition um, and with her personal archive for a number of years now. Um, it was actually initiated by Dr. Lee Rayford, um, who has wonderfully passed the torch of project management onto Dr. Leah T. Bascom, who uh, works in the Africana Studies Department at uh, Georgia State University. Um, I joined the project in 2017 to help uh, physically kind of assess uh, Kathleen Cleaver's archive, um, which is like a huge um, amalgamation of personal papers and uh, personal photographs, both from her lifetime, but also uh, her family members uh, before and sort of family members who, who joined uh, the Cleavers, uh, not by uh, biology, I suppose. Um, but essentially, the collaborators are kind of spread out across the United States, and we haven't been able to meet in person for quite some time. So the, the BSC was able to fund us to uh, gather in person finally um, and sort of return to the original site of where this project happened, which is housed um, originally at Kathleen Cleaver's house, but which her archive is now uh, transferred to the Emory Rose Manscript Library um, at Emory. Um, excuse me. And uh, essentially, we needed to revisit the original uh, site of where our exhibition will go on view, which is the Auburn Avenue Research Library in Atlanta. Um, and we wanted to have a new kind of renewed sense of what that space can offer. Should we eventually be able to put um, Ms. Kathleen Cleaver's papers and photographs on the walls. Um, and so here's a photograph of one of my collaborators, Stephanie Alvarado, uh, kind of assessing what the space can offer us. Um, but also we wanted to get together in person uh, to be able to visit the physical archive again. Um, there were some holes in our conception of the exhibition, which has made uh, getting funding a little bit difficult. We wanted to think through how to expand the way that we're narrating. Um, so we had a really wonderful time. Uh, we got together in the Africana Studies Department's um, sort of meeting room, uh, which was really wonderful. And we got a chance to meet the chair of that department who's been sort of helping Dr. Bascom continue to fund the project um, and sort of give it the attention it needs uh, over all of these years. Um, it was also right after my birthday, so everyone was really nice to me and they uh, celebrated <laughs> with me and we had the funds to eat together, which is always essential. So we went to the uh, sweet Auburn Avenue market, um, just kind of reorienting ourselves in the space of this really historical black community and understanding Kathleen Cleaver's relationship to it as well and, and what it means to put her photographs on view in a space that needs to be welcoming and inviting. Um, so uh, we also got to revisit um, 
a number of individuals that were original collaborators on the project, uh, which included Dr. Clint Fluker, who works at Emory Library as well. We actually had never met in person. Um, so it was just really essential to be able to uh, orient with him, who, and he is now sort of the community manager um, and engagement officer for the Emory Library. So again, trying to understand how Kathleen's uh, sort of ethos uh, is able to come out through the project and with uh, sort of making sure that the community feels um, involved. And so the archive entered at Emory's library a number of years ago, um, and we all haven't been able to gather to look at it together in some time. So it was really wonderful to be able to visit photographs that we were already very familiar with, but it's such a massive amount of material. We were able to uncover a, a number of things that were new to us. Um, we were also charged specifically um, from Kathleen Cleaver's family to look for specific items that helped round out her really multifaceted persona, which included um, like a really direct and beautiful engagement with pedagogy and teaching. So we were trying to find both ephemera, but photographs that helped uh, illustrate these kind of relationships she has with people. And then also we wanted to look for more photographs of Kathleen and her sort of leisure life. Um, she is a huge public figure and is a very well-known um, like icon through specific photographs, but how do we see her differently across the spectrum of her life? So these are some of the um, highlights. Uh, this is my hand trying to unravel a really beautiful letter that Kathleen had wrote her father when she was um, in elementary school about making the honor roll. Um, and then on the right is a paragraph her mother wrote Kathleen's father about how she struggled with math, which I really appreciated as well. So balance and academics. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to share is archive promise and surprises. Uh, so when we were looking for um, things to orient uh, Kathleen's relationship to um, emerging scholars and professionals and people who are invested in a history of visual culture, we came across this photo of Dr. Lee Rayford um, and Dr. Courtney Baker. Um, and that was just sort of beautiful kind of uh, circle to close out how we all came about and entered this project. And we like to speculate that uh, Kathleen probably took this photograph herself. So another part of the many ways that she is a creative individual who is really oriented around visual culture, curating, um, self-archiving and such. Thank you. Thank you, Delphine, and we will have Elaine next. Um, hi, thank you so much. Um, it's really so wonderful to be here and to share a little bit about um, what we're doing at the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, where I am an associate curator. Um, I thought I'd say a little bit about the project first, because I think the real because uh, I'm sort of a representative of, the, of an institutional grantee but I'm just really thrilled that Abby is here too because she can actually report on um, the work from the other side as well. So I'm glad that we can tag team this. Um, so the larger context for my project is um, an exhibition I'm working on currently entitled Rooted West, African-American Quilts in California um, after 1940. And it's intended to celebrate both the quilt makers and quilt keepers who came to California in the context of the Second Great Migration. Um, and the show is really meant to also um, call attention to and present really for the first time um, an historic gift of over 3,000 quilts that were gifted to the university back in 2019. Uh, they were compiled and collected by um, an Oakland-based collector, Eli Leon, who lived just um, right off of Alcatraz in Dover. Um, but as you might imagine, working with any 3,000 of anything is pretty massive. And so um, I have, you know, I definitely have some collaborators, but mainly have just been sort of really kind of thinking through 
how best to um, really reconnect the quilts that he collected, both in the East Bay, in San Francisco, in Marin, and in the American South, and to connect it back to black life and to center the stories and the makers and the values and the, the traditions of quilt making um, from which the entire collection emerges from. Um, and so the Small Grants Project for me was just so exciting because it was this really this first opening for me to bring the quilts to, or try to connect it to student life and to, and to um, student engagement. And so I sort of just conceived this particular project as a visual essay for the quilts exhibition catalog. Um, and again, you know, just to recall that white gallery space you saw on the other slide, you can sort of see how even the museum space is so far removed <laughs> from the homes, the hands, the bodies that have touched these quilts. And so I really wanted the visual essay to be an opportunity for viewers, readers, visitors, anybody to really connect the objects to their context, really. Um, kind of what I like to talk about is like quilts in the wild, right? Like in the homes and families passing between um, families and generations. Um, and so the grant was able to fund Abby and I was so thrilled that she applied and that we could work together. And I thought now I'll just hand it off to her to sh share a little bit about um, how things went and how the themes came together. That sounds great. I wish that I could see this, but the glare is really crazy, so <laughs> like, I'm just gonna be pressing buttons. But um, yeah, so I did research within Eli Leon's collection of like film slides. Like he took photos of quilters and like people he met. Um, he took photos of the quilts as well. Um, and I did a lot of online research to find some of these photos. Um, yeah, and a lot were from like the Library of Congress or other projects within that. Um, I have sort of memory folk life collection photos in there, Chicago ethnic arts project collections. Um, yeah, and I came up with some themes to kind of organize the essay. So one is kind of about like uh, utility and like how quilts are used. Um, and there I just wanted to include like some interesting photos of quilts used in interesting ways and um, like how utility and aesthetics like come together and are separate but together. Um, and then another theme was porches because I noticed so many photos of the quilts were on porches. Maybe because like that's the space that's big enough to actually be able to hold it up to take a photo, um, but also because that's like a gathering place. Um, and I referenced the Trudy R. Harris essay about porch sitting and um, he like describes it as an activity that somebody does, not just like a place, I guess. Um, another theme is about archival memory and how like quilts can be kept as an archive of your family or your community or whoever made them. Um, yeah, and there's a, I don't know if it's in here. I guess it's not, but there's a really cool photo of, um, oh, okay, cool is a crazy word for this because it's actually tragic, so never mind, I take that back, but um, <laughs> there's, a, <laughs> there's a picture of um, a woman mending a quilt that reads April 21st, 1927, and it commemorates a flood um, of like, I think Mississippi or like the surrounding areas around the Mississippi River. Um, yeah, it's just like an amazing photo. Um, it's in like white lettering on a black background with like a cross pattern um, that just looks like an alarm, you know, or like a warning. Um, yeah, and it's just amazing to imagine like this person's artistic impulses to create something like that um, and to keep it and for it to be something that is mended. And the last theme was about um, just like the large life of quilts. And I also noticed in a lot of the photos that quilts just look massive next to people because they are, but also just how the photos came out. Um, and there I wrote about how meanings about quilts can kind of go beyond like the actual physical quilt, um, especially because I don't know, the fact that it's something that's cozy feels so important to me. Like, um, I don't know, like themes of home and comfort and like thinking about particular family members and like for it to be a physical, tangible object that you can experience just felt important to talk about to me. So yes, that's it. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, Valencia, could you speak about how um, the small grants opened up new avenues of research, new collaborations. 
um, or new opportunities in general? Yes, it was, um, yeah, just to, to be able to travel to Barbados um, and, and be there for three weeks, uh, that really helped to defray the, the cost because it's, it's pretty steep. Um, and it, it was so special to me uh, to be there, to actually be physically in the dock, that place of gathering. There was actually uh, an exhibition uh, about the history of, of, of the landship in the dock and that unfortunately it's not like a publicly it's not a publicly accessible place so it was special to to get the access through through dr hand and his uh, he's on the adv advisory committee of the landship and so um yeah just being there in person um meant a lot so now i'm thinking about how we can tell stories um, and it's a new it's actually a new direction for my practice my practice is actually was has been rooted in dance performance and so that's how I first approached the work and now I'm leaving with some experience video like do my own video editing um, like what does it mean to set up the camera like you know it's just uh, I, I'm really excited about telling um, stories of, of my people Thank you. And Delphine, could you expand on the new collaborations, new opportunities? Yeah. Um, the work of the curators with the archive has always uh, been a part of the project, sort of narrating our own collective work. And it was in 2017, it was being, um, there was like a video project that accompanied it. And that sort of uh, went away, but one of our um, artists, John Stevens, that's a part of the project, he has renewed um, interest in videography. So this sort of meta dimension of archiving our work with the archive uh, is taking on a different direction. Um, so that was really surprising and he has like wholly committed to um, acquiring all of this really expensive equipment. Um, so I'm excited to see where that goes. And he was sort of uh, taking video of us the whole time. Um, the other thing that surprised me uh, was uh, some personal research, maybe, like another project that might come about. So I was looking in the archive by myself one day, and there was um, an, a box of unknowns and I ended up looking at um, a really intimate and personal uh, photo album that was falling apart that uh, was produced by Geronimo Pratt when he was um, incarcerated and just sort of seeing this like all of the snapshots that had been sent to him and what the uh, really intimate uh, letters were and sort of writings around them. Um, I think there's a very clear sense of the importance of um, archiving and collecting one's personal photographs, but to be able to experience that at the same time as being in the Emory Rose Library was very, was a jarring experience, because, um, you know, archives within the institution are so uh, sterile. So I'm still working through and processing what that uh, encounter means, yeah. Thank you, and Elaine, could you, uh give us an insight on uh, the new uh, collaborations that emerged, uh, that the grants facilitated, and um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and I don't know, maybe like Abby and I could respond Or methodological that. approaches. Sure. Be quite um, nice. Maybe I'll, I'll say methodologically speaking, um, I, my, my whole orientation in, to, this, to the collection of the material is really to take my cue from the values of the object, if that makes sense. So if you think of quilts as um, in traditionally inherently a very collaborative and collective effort, um, it is intergenerational, it is about um, gathering and offering care to, to the relationship and the kin around you. Um, and they also, before you know, quilts enter into an art economy, they're part of a gifting and giving economy. It's about giving care and sharing um, and they're and they are a site of just real creative um, expression um, the, I wish I could say it more eloquently but just yeah it's it's a place where as a creator and I think of so many of the um, the black mothers and women grandmothers and aunties who are um, 
who have that space for themselves with, with fabric and thread. Um, I really wanted all of those values to lead the exhibition, which is actually really hard to do in a museum <laughs> where there are so many protocols and people who need to approve things, um, where sometimes, yeah, the, I think the expectation that a single curated show could somehow, you know, a singly curated show could somehow express or encompass the entirety of this history just felt um, pretty um, inadequate in a way. And so I guess, um, again, the grant, as I alluded to earlier, just felt like a really small gesture in that direction. Um, and so, which is why, again, I was just so grateful that Abby could, could be just really a conversation partner in thinking about this visual essay component to the exhibition. Um, I should just, on a side note, mention my hope is that once the images themselves are kind of finalized, we have all the rights and reproductions, um, I hope that also in the life, it'll have a life in the exhibition catalog, which will be the archive of the show, but then I'm also hoping might make it into the gallery itself. Um, I don't know, Abby, anything you wanna add? Yeah, I kind of feel similarly about like, um, I don't know, taking cues from the clothes themselves or the photos themselves. Um, I feel like I didn't write anything that revolutionary in this essay. I think that like, um, it was like kind of all there and I just wrote about the quotes and the photos. So I guess that's my methodological, methodological approach. I don't know. <laughs> but, I, but I will say, I hope it was facilitated too by, um, we had um, at least a couple of collections visits to our offsite warehouse out in Richmond. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, like so at this point I've seen like all 3,000 of them, but I don't know what it was like for you just to see, mm -hmm. you know, like the 20 or 30 or so. It was beautiful, yeah. Um, I felt really lucky to like be able to tangibly experience them um, because they're tangible objects and I don't know if a picture like necessarily does that justice, um, but yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, so the next question is about challenges. Um, how did you uh, deal with challenges? Uh, if you were able to resolve them or how did you, when you encountered a challenge, how did you adapt to um, the obstacle that was presented to you um, with your respective projects? And Valencia, you can begin. Okay, um, well, first challenge. Okay, there are several. <laughs> um, well, one was like arriving to Barbados and I got COVID on the way. So my first week was out, but in a way it was like, it was interesting because it was a, both a challenge and a blessing because um, I was actually traveling with my family. So I have a four year old and in a way like, thankfully they didn't get sick, but then I was able to kind of use that time to really um, rest and regroup and, and, and hyper-focus because I would have had to like juggle childcare and um, yeah, and, and, and getting the project on track. And just, it was about, you know, trust. I also, you know, I was gonna work with a certain videographer that didn't work out. So I, thankfully I was able to, you know, find, you know, someone who was already, you know, that I already knew. So it was just kind of, moving with it like like water <laughs> you know so that's what mm -hmm. i'm taking from it like and just trusting and um and grasping the the lessons or the opportunities that the challenges give in the moment yeah and for yourself delphine um yeah i think i alluded to it in my last uh answer which is the problem of when the archive goes in, when a personal archive, family archive goes into the institution. So when we first started the project, it was housed in Kathleen Kleber's home and there was this like wonderful warmth um, in this space. There was her laughter. There was the opportunity for all of us to sort of uh, be more of ourselves. And when we tried to see the archive at Emory, uh, we weren't allowed to see it together um, because of the limitations of people, uh, the numbers of people allowed to be with the archive. So that was just really kind of disorienting and disappointing. So then all of this sort of movement of people to be um, gathered together, we ended up being split apart in different rooms and like zooming in the same 
library <laughs> um, and showing one another the archive on Zoom once again. So that was like a really weird challenge um, mm -hmm. and disappointing. Um, but we still were able to find uh, really promising things. Uh, the other challenge has been um, not necessarily being in as much direct contact uh, with Kathleen Cleaver and her family as we would like because we're trying to be as uh, committed to her vision and, and what she had hoped for this project as we can be. Um, and we had hoped that we would be able to do like a drive by her house and say hi and everything. Um, but they had their own um, issues with housing at the time. So that ended up being on FaceTime as well. But we still got to say hi to her. Um, and she was still really excited about the project. So um, definitely pivoted in a surprising way. But it was great still. Thank you. And Amy and Elaine, did you encounter any challenges that presented room for adaptation and experimenting? I had a great time. What challenges did you have, Elaine? <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, well, just on a very pra practical note, like life happened. I did go on maternity leave for a part of the term. Um, so I just want to just give a shout out to Abby just for being so gracious and, you know, kind of adapting with me on that. Um, but I, I hope, um, I feel like we were able to just continue our conversations. We did have at least monthly check-ins or mm -hmm. bi-monthly check-ins. Um, just really wanted to make time for, for Abby and just reflect and have it be an ongoing conversation. And I will say, in kind of like a newborn mom phase, it's actually really welcome to talk to an adult. <laughs> um, so, um, but, but that I would say adapting on that front, um, I also just sort of wish just from, uh, I guess, the on the man managerial or kind of like curatorial side that the project was a little further along, you know, for Abby, for us to just have like, you know, just whenever you feel like a project is sort of early on, but you kind of wish it were, you were further along that, that um, some of the concepts were, were more in place. But um, I, uh, yeah, and just wish I could be more present, but I think um, to have Abby's sort of the themes and a core group of images in place, I'm really excited to keep building on that and that to have her voice still preserved and a part of the project I'm really excited for. Thank you. I just realized I call you Amy instead of Abby. I'm so sorry. I didn't even that. notice. Um, yeah, so uh, this is um, a really great question on the topic Black Gathering. Um, I'd just like you to speak a bit more about uh, why it's important to you um, and perhaps just expand on the ways in which it um, emerges in the work that you did, um, particularly with um, a masquerading tradition, which seems a little bit tricky because people see it as something, but it's actually something else, which is what I got. So you just speak on that a bit. Yes, I will actually take this opportunity to, to speak a bit about, yeah, about the performance itself, because in, in the first slide, you, you would have seen a, a tall structure, and I didn't uh, explain what it was. It's actually a maypole, so um, the, in the performances, there's a procession, and then uh, in two, so, um, and, and then there's the performance of the drills or the maneuvers, and then after that comes the maypole. And um, yeah, earlier on in the process of, of the work, when I got to actually create a maypole with uh, Samuel Wildman, who um, just um, graduated earlier this year, and I, and I, you know, I got to present it in the Worth Writer Gallery. There was just an amazing uh, ritual that happened that <laughs> Professor Rayford was a part of it um, in the closing event. It, be, it just became, I, I, I envisioned it as a reclaiming of um, something that was normally seen as colonial. And, and I just put Pan-African colors for the ribbons. And, uh, and then, you know, there, this amazing Pan-African ritual of, of the maypole uh, manifested in the closing event. And it, that's something that I carry very dear to my spirit. Um, because that's for me, it's that's the you know quintessential like that gathering, that beautiful kind of um, being in fellowship with each other, and and you're you know it's it's eight of you and you're plotting 
um, this maple together. Um, and then it's also, you, you flat it and then you have to unflat it. And that becomes in a riddle, in itself a riddle. And I like the idea of this collaborative community problem solving. And I feel like that really encapsulated, you know, what, what land, why landship is, like why it was uh, created. And it's about this um, a community coming together and, um, and then, you know, this leaving and these, the, the way it binds you, you know, and strengthens you as a community. So um, I think that's, that would be my answer. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, Delphine, could you expand on why the topic of gathering is important to you and the ways in which it emerged from uh, your work around the photographic archive, particularly a personal um, photographic archive? Yeah, I think, um, it's hard to quickly narrate all of the many parts of the exhibition because uh, it's about how multifaceted Kathleen Cleaver is. Um, but I think we're being together allowed us to shift towards understanding Ms. Cleaver's like sort of center as being a person of creativity and collaboration um, and how that manifested often meant um, being able to gather many different people, obviously that uh, is most explicitly known through the Black Panther Party, but more um, specifically what it meant for her to uh, foster really unique relationships with photographers, or we saw Emery Douglas earlier, um, working with him very closely, but also what that looked like for her prior to the Black Panther moments um, as a student uh, working with SNCC. Um, and then later in her life, working really closely with different um, sort of liberation movements, even in France. But essentially, that kind of means of her gathering different activist personas is what we've been trying to mirror in our work for the project. Um, and I think that allowed us to, uh, being together allowed us to orient around all of our different uh, new professional roles. So Sierra King is a photographer on the project, but she's been working to sort of create um, really uh, sort of beautiful, intimate relationships with the Atlanta community to teach them how to self-archive. Um, and how her career has grown has definitely informed the way that we relate to archive building as well. Um, and then Stephanie Alvarado, who's also on the project, lives in New York, and she herself is uh, articulating new archivist practices too. Um, so I think, uh, like in a conceptual way, there's the gathering of many different uh, like gifts and talents, um, but also uh, just really trying to foreground that our, our a uh, call for this project is to reflect uh, Kathleen Cleaver's principles. Yeah. That's great. Um, Elaine and Abby, could you speak to um, the theme of uh, gathering? Sure. Um, yeah, I'm, I think the um, quotes like, in some circumstances are something that's life sustaining and like therefore facilitates community and togetherness, especially in a family setting. Um, I went to a lecture with uh, two quilters from G's Bend, Alabama, Mary Ann Petway and China Petway. And they both talked about um, growing up in living circumstances where um, if their mother didn't sew quilts out of scraps, then they would have been freezing at night and not be able to sleep. Um, so like just in that it's something that's life sustaining, I think that it facilitates black gathering and also um, they talked about now that they're well known for quilting, they, their life circumstances are not the same and quilting can be like a, um, more of a completely aesthetic process for them. Um, and it still facilitates black gathering, um, like this lecture full of black people watching them talk about quilts, so yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot to all of you. And I think we can open up uh, to questions from the audience. Oh, okay.